All right, so we've been working our way through the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, we're going verse by verse through the Gospel of Matthew, and we're about halfway through the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus' most famous teaching section. And in this sermon, Jesus gathered his disciples around for this teaching moment, and we know the crowds gathered around him as well to to hear um, just what he has to say. And in this, Jesus cast his vision for, for this kingdom that he's kind of initiated, installing the already but not yet, and all those different things we hear about. Jesus is talking about what it looks like. He explains what it looks like to be his follower. He explains how he's come to fulfill both the law and the prophets, which is the the entire Jewish Old Testament. And and he gives us a refresh of what it looks like to live a life honoring to God. And so far, we've learned some challenging things. But today is perhaps his most popular, the most popular section. And of all his teachings, this right here has made its way into pop culture. Some of the sayings that Jesus says, and maybe we didn't know it came from Jesus, but it does. It sounds like slogans, kind of some nice to do's. And while they're popular, these are probably the most difficult things to actually pull off. And as we go through it, I bet you'll be challenged as I was and I am to go, how can anybody actually do this? I mean, is he serious? Is he, is he going just too far? And, and, and the problem with that is when something becomes really challenging, when it's very difficult, we just kind of blow it off, right? We can just put it to the side like, well, won't even come close. So we're just going to kind of set that to the side. But what this is, and, and to understand it a bit better, this is simply what Jesus teaches today It is simply grace applied. This is what grace looks like applied to everyday life. And this is the call for every single Christian to work through and apply what grace means because of the grace of God, what it means for us to then extend grace to everyone else. This is through our relationships with other people. Let's jump right in. Matthew 5, verse 38, he says this. Jesus says, you've heard the law that says the punishment much match the injury. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is a direct quote from the Old Testament law that lays out the principle of retribution and gave them the formula on how to deal with a crime. Whatever you did must be done back to you. And this ensured that the courts administered uh, punishments justly. So people got exactly what they deserved, exactly what happened, what they did would happen back to them. And this, of course, speaks to the justice part of all of us that says, that's right. If you hurt me, you need to be hurt. Well, if you hurt my kids, right? How about that? You hurt my kids, you need to be hurt. If someone steals from you, You need to take from them. This is getting back. This is justice. This is making sure people get exactly what's coming to them. And here's what I know about you because I know it about myself. We love justice when it comes for other people getting exactly what they want. But when it comes to something we did wrong, we like grace, don't we? We're like, well, you need to get what you deserve. But look, it was an accident when I did it. You know, it shouldn't count. Like, can't you just forgive me? Things like that is what we work through. But listen to what Jesus says, verse 39. He says, But I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right, slaps you on the right cheek, offer them the other cheek also. And this word resist can also be used for taking legal action. And a slap on the right cheek was a backhand from somebody. And this is a public insult. This isn't the idea so much of someone punching you and you just sitting there being a punching bag for them. This is more of an insult. This is publicly attacking your uh, honor and dignity. All right, and this is an honor and shame culture. So they're publicly disgracing you in front of everybody. And turning the other cheek is then, instead of retaliating, it's it's it's... It's being vulnerable. It's giving them the permission to slap your other cheek. Rather than taking, we give. We relax. 
We don't go out for vengeance and retribution right away. So if you slap someone in the face like this, you would face punishment and a hefty fine. But Jesus sees, rather than seeking that, de-escalate the situation. Offer them the other cheek as well. Rather than always being ready to be offended, be ready to be offended and not attack others. Look at verse 40. If you are sued in court, and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. Now, under their law, nobody could actually take your coat from you, no matter how much you owed, no matter what you did, because it also served as a blanket. And so they felt that people at least deserve the right to cover themselves. Because here's the deal. If you're getting sued for your shirt, how much stuff do you think you actually have? Think about it. If someone's taking you to court for your shirt you got on right now, you probably don't have a lot else, do you? And so that's the idea. They, they want to take your shirt, give to them what they aren't even legally allowed to take from you. Go above and beyond. Be willing to be vulnerable and stripped naked to satisfy this wrath of this other person who wants to take from you. Verse 41 says, if a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Military, the Romans could require citizens to help them carry their weight. And remember, this isn't a theory. This isn't just an idea. You're talking to an occupied people group. You have the Jews who Rome have come and taken over their country. You have to pay them taxes. They're ruling over you. And the law says that, hey, you're required to help them and carry their bags for a mile. And Jesus says, well, don't just do it for a mile. Go above and beyond. Carry it for two miles, which would make a four-mile walk for you if you were coming back. Rather than being aggravated, rather than being aggressive, always complaining about your rights and how wrong everyone else, Jesus says, listen, just, just go the extra mile to serve other people. Verse 42, and this is super challenging. Give to those who ask, and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. Not only are we supposed to respond positively to people who treat us terribly, but we're supposed to give to those who beg and borrow. We are to give those in need. We are to be marked with just this generosity that if people asks us for th- ask us for something, we give it to them. It doesn't say give them everything they ask for, by the way. This isn't the right for someone to come in and de- demand the, the deed to your house or anything like that. But if someone's begging, if someone needs help, he says, don't turn away. Give to them. Help them. Even those who you know can't pay you back, give to them anyways. Jesus is teaching that Christians should be known for generosity, not asking for money. And if we were to pull the landscape of our our culture and ask them, do Christians give more or do they request more? How do you think they'd respond? We should be known for our generosity. So grace applied means our first response is to avoid retribution, getting even, getting revenge, paying people back for what they've done, both legally, because this is all their court system, right? This is where we have to apply our ethics, not only personally, but legally, and like work through all of that. We're to seek to lay down our rights for the benefit of other people. And listen, I can't tell you what this looks like in every situation because this is ridiculously challenging what Jesus says here. But I can tell you this is where we need to start moving towards. Living graciously. Rather than always getting worked up, ready to defend our rights, trying to take vengeance and justice in our own hands, right? Like our own version of Batman. Instead of living that out in the world, we're to be gracious and loving Rather than be on the offense, Jesus says, be ready to be offended for my name. And the pushback is, I really do get it, like, he can't be serious. Like, there's no way anybody could do this. But remember what Jesus said at the very beginning, Matthew 5, he he told us this, Matthew 5, 5. He said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Remember, meek doesn't mean weak. In order to be meek, in order to turn the other cheek, in order to allow someone to take advantage of you, that means you could actually put a whooping on them. Y'all know what a whooping is? That's how we said it in Virginia. 
I'm sure y'all ain't or people say something like that. <laughs> to be meek doesn't mean to be weak, that you can't do anything, that you don't have any rights, that you couldn't sue them, that you couldn't take them out. Being meek means, oh, I very much could, but I'm choosing not to. I'm allowing you to offend me. I'm allowing you to take from me. I could stop you, but I'm not. I'm giving up my rights. And do you realize how confident enough you have to be to let this happen? Do you realize how strong and secure in your identity in Christ and, and who you are to allow someone to publicly embarrass you and you not retaliate against them? I mean, how secure do you need to be? And that's what Jesus is calling us to be. Rather than seek retribution, we seek peace, we resolve, we forgive, and it truly takes a confident, secure person to actually pull this off. And it'd be one thing if Jesus stopped here, but he doesn't. Look at the next part. He goes straight in, verse 43. He says, you've heard that the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Love your neighbor was a truth well known from the Old Testament, but the trouble is they would narrowly define who their neighbor was. So for us, it'd be like, maybe I can love my next door neighbor, don't really have a choice, share a fence with them, trying to work it out. But three doors down, there ain't no way. There ain't no way I'm going to love them. I can't. They're not really my neighbor anyways. It's three doors down, not my next door neighbor. So then God's not really calling me to love them. And so we would say, they would say, well, it's only my neighbor is. It's the people who look like me, who sound like me, who talk like me, who have the same beliefs like me. Well, those are my neighbors. But those other people... Can't love them. They're too different. In fact, Christians still operate on this principle. You hear the slogan of God hates sin, and, and that is true. The cliche is hate the sin, uh, but love the person. And while I appreciate the sentiment there and what people are trying to say, what actually happens is Christians give themselves an excuse to hate people who are in sin. We give ourselves an excuse to, to dislike people. Well, we don't say we hate them, do we? We just don't let our kids play with them. We don't talk with them. We shun them. We don't really want them coming in the doors. We don't really want to be around them. Or we pick at them. Some Christians do things like that. Start publicly attacking. Jesus is like, no, no, no. Let, let's fix this. Instead of narrowly defining who your neighbor is and, and this idea of hating your enemy... Uh, which is actually never said. It just must be something that they, they came up with or just a common idea. Jesus said, I, let's fix this, verse 44. But I say, love your enemies. You're like, my enemies? He's like, yeah. So I got to love my neighbor, yep. So I got to love my enemies, yep. So how do I get out of this then, Jesus? How do we get out of this, Christian? How, how do we publicly, how do Christians publicly bash, talk bad, attack people? How, how do we do this? When, even if they're our enemies, we love them and pray for those who persecute you. So we are to love those who want to hurt us. We pray for those who are trying to attack us. We do for them what they cannot do themselves. We intercede for them at the throne of God, asking him to intervene and bless their lives. So we do the greatest thing possible, take them before God and ask for his help in this. So we love everyone. And what does that mean? The best I can understand it, it's that we hope and wish and do the good for everyone. We look out for people. We work for their good, trying to help them, trying to help them understand God. But even more than that, we want to help them with good works. So to love is not to shun, it's to do good. And it sounds impossible, but here's Jesus's point. He says, in this way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends his rain on the just and the unjust alike. So God's common grace affects all people, both good and evil. Therefore, we are acting as true representatives of God, of our Father. We are acting as true Christians. We are loving people, showing them grace, all of them. Because ultimately, who's, they're going to stand before God, they're going to stand before the throne, and they will be held accountable for what they've done. But for us, Christian, that's not our job. It's not our job to do that. 
Now, we've talked about this before. Paul tells us we can judge those people inside the church. You're a Christian? Yep, let's go. We, we, can, we can talk about ways we need to grow, things we need to do, because we're agreeing to be Jesus followers. But those outside the church, we don't, we don't condemn them. They haven't agreed to our set of rules. They haven't agreed to be Jesus followers. What are we doing? He says, love them. Like, that's what we are to do, to love them, to help them. So we should show common grace, common love, because all people deserve love, dignity, and respect. They're made in the image of God, even if they don't know that. He says in verse 46, he says, if you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. So all groups take care of their own. They look out for people. Even Nazis looked out for each other. So like, that's just a common human thing. So showing love and being gracious for people who show you love and are gracious to you, that's not a Christian thing. That's just a human thing. That's what people do. He says we are to go above and beyond that. We are to see the world as God sees it. We are to show grace and mercy even to those who wish us harm, which is challenging. And so when do we stop? When is enough enough? And then he ends with this. It's like, thanks, Jesus. This is helpful. Verse 48, he says, but you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. We're like, so wait, what does that mean? This kind of stuff should keep you up at night. This is the kind of stuff, this is the stuff Jesus said. If we actually paid attention to him, this, he was rough. And he said, well, just be perfect. What does that mean, Jesus? It means we are to strive for love. We are to strive for mercy. We are trying to live perfectly as our heavenly Father is perfect. And I'm telling you, this verse used to bother me. It used to just really be this idea of like, I knew it was there. I wanted to avoid it because I had no idea what to do with it. But then it kind of clicked. Here's what's going on. Take an athlete. Take an athlete, whatever sport. Let's say you're trying to perfect your swing. They will look at all the great swings out there. They will break down every aspect of their swing. I know this because I know some of them. And it's funny how serious they take this golf swing or this bat swing. Like it's so serious. And they break it down bit by bit, point by point. They'll even get coaches. And they'll pay people to help them with this swing. And every time they go to hit the ball, they will do their best to emulate that perfect swing. But does it happen every time? No. But do they still strive for the perfect swing every single time? Well, of course. If Jesus would have said anything less, he would have given us a small, shallow goal. But he's like, no, no, your goal when you stop is when you become perfect, when you live in this life that, that reflects the Father reflects Jesus, which means our work will never be done. But we don't look at it as this, like, I'm just going to beat myself up. We, sh just like an athlete, strive to get better. We strive to do better, not to earn our way into heaven, but to emulate God, to be his, represent be his representatives on this earth. So we strive for the ideal, so loving and gracious to all. And here's the mind-blowing thing about this. What I know Jesus says here just seems radically impossible. I get it. We need to kind of work towards this. But what's so amazing about this is this isn't Jesus just giving us information on what to do. He's actually laying out everything he has come to do. Everything he describes here, he actually pulls off himself. It's a timeline of events that we see him fulfill throughout the gospel. You see, Jesus, do you remember? He was slapped by the temple guards in front of everybody and didn't retaliate against it. They not only took his shirt, they stripped him down naked and beat him and hung him to a bloody cross. Jesus went this idea of an extra mile, think about that, by coming to earth to begin with, that God wrapped himself in human flesh and came to us, left the glorious throne room of heaven to come to us to take then responsibility for our sin. Think about the bags he's carrying for us going extra mile. Jesus came all the way here to be with us. Jesus freely gave, when he says give to anyone who's asked, think about this. Jesus freely gave his life before we even asked. 
He helped before we knew we needed help. He died while we were yet sinners to demonstrate his great love. The Father gave his Son, the Son gave his life, so you and me could experience his love and grace and freedom. He prayed for them as they nailed his body to the cross and said, Father, forgive them. God loved us, loves us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. So while we were his enemies, before we did anything good, we turned our back. That's what sin is, going away from God, not paying attention to what he wants, living our own way. Yet he loved us enough to die for us and call us into a, resp- a relationship with him. So the love he showed, the greatest love and grace is shown by God himself. So everything he's describing is what he actually does for us. And then this idea of per- perfection, Jesus actually perfects us. Remember, once we come to know Jesus, we are sanctified. We are considered a saint. We are considered holy. So what becomes true, read the first chapter of Ephesians. What becomes true of Jesus is now true of us. So we are in Christ. So we are now perfected. When God sees us, he sees Jesus. Like that's been applied to our lives. So through our salvation... There is no condemnation for the Christian. That's grace in action. Him doing what we could never do ourselves. And then calling us to live like him, to apply that grace to other people. And so Jesus is teaching to say, listen, this is what I'm about to do. You're going to see this play out. Now, once you accept me, once you give your life to me, once you're a Jesus follower, you then go out and apply this grace to everyone else. You see, remember, the only reason why we have the teachings from Jesus is not just because he died for our sins. Listen, plenty of people died and plenty of people told things throughout the 2,000 years Jesus was here. But through his resurrection, because he rose from the grave, because he defeated death, like that's the reason why we have Jesus' teachings. That's the reason why we can have this hope. Not because we're just like anybody else, not just because it's another teaching, because he died and rose again, and everybody was like, well, you know what? If he can do that, let's just go ahead and apply everything else he said. We don't have to worry about this life. We don't have to hold on to it so tightly. We don't have to be greedy. We don't have to be fearful. We don't have to be scared. We don't have to stand up for our rights when we know Jesus has already stood up for us in the throne room of God. Like, we're good. So the hope we have, the grace found in Christ, allows us to give up our rights here, to know he's already earned more than we could ever earn. You see, acts of grace, they really do change the world. Standing up for our rights, fighting with people, always being offended, always being aggravated, that doesn't change the world. That's the same revenge story we've heard forever. I'm going to get them back. They hurt me, I'm going to hurt them. But actively, aggressively showing grace that changes things. You see, Jesus wasn't passive. He was aggressively in showing grace and mercy to others. And for us in our country, we only have to look a couple decades back to look at what Martin Luther King did and those nonviolent movements, how it literally did change our country because they applied grace. They stood up in the face and followed Jesus's teachings. It actually works, but it's radically difficult to do. But that's our calling as Jesus followers. And so here's some ways we can pull this off. There's some ideas you get to brainstorm as well. But maybe for you, turning the other cheek, it means you just stop living aggressively trying to find ways to be offended. Listen, I know people, you probably know people. If you don't know anybody, then guess who it is? It's you, right? We've talked about that before, right? Who always look to be offended. They're always looking that someone hurt them or someone did this. They really believe they're that important that everybody else is out to get them. How about we just stop looking to be offended all the time? We stop thinking everybody's out to get us. What if turn the other cheek means we just kind of relax and just allow that if someone is humiliating us, just okay, got it. And how about we aggressively seek forgiveness for all those wrongs and all that pain. We aggressively seek to forgive as Christ forgave 
us. And what about going the extra mile? What about, what if it was for you, it just simply means going above and beyond? Like maybe for you, instead of just doing the bare minimum at work, you go above and beyond. Just because nobody gives you praise, just because nobody tells you well done, doesn't mean you can't follow Jesus and go the extra mile, doing far more than what people expect. And what does it look like for you to give to other people, to be generous, to help others? One of the ways we, I've tried to show my kids this, model it with my kids. Once you have kids, you start thinking about this stuff a little bit more, right? Like, uh-oh, what am I showing them, what am I not? But what we try to do is every time someone asks for money on the road, someone, a homeless person, we try to give every time. It's like, well, good for you. Saying, Look, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that's a way to apply that if somebody is there asking for money, a simple way to apply Jesus' statement is to what? Give them money. But how many times you go, well, they deserve it. They did it to themselves. Well, how do you know? Right? Give them $3 and move on. Give them five bucks. Well, inflation, give them $10 so they can get a soda. That's how much they cost nowadays. (laughs) Right? Give them a couple bucks. Like, it's it's okay. And the reason why I did that, because I saw my father do that. And it always struck me as odd. But just watching other people, and maybe for you, it just starts there. Being generous is this big thing. You've never been generous. Just kind of keep it all to yourself. But maybe just the people who are simply asking for help. Just give them some help or go buy them some food. We are generous because Christ was generous for us. We were broken. We were poor. We are sinful people who needed rescuing. And Christ came to us. And so what does it look like for you to love others? Love your enemies. What does that even mean, Jesus? That's too much. Well, how about this? What if we just love the people who disagree with us? What if we started there? What if you actively sought to love those Democrats? Or you actively sought to love those Republicans? Like, we're talking about our enemies. We don't even love our own people in our country. We got a lot of work to do, Christians. What if we simply started loving and working for the good of people who believed a little bit differently than us? Who thought a little differently? What instead of being violent and aggravated and mean and always ready to lash out, especially on social media, what if we just loved people who were different? You see, this is what the church is supposed to be known for. We should be radically different in our love, grace, and mercy. And for the life of me, let me stand on my soapbox for one minute. For the life of me, I cannot figure out why Christians live judgmental, condemning lives, just sticking their nose up at everybody else. I don't understand it. Because it's not what Jesus teaches, like, at all. He teaches us to love and show mercy and be gracious That's who we're called to be. And if we think about what does it mean to love our enemies, it means wishing and hoping the best for them. Rather than praying for their demise, praying that people fail, pray the best for them. Pray that goodness will happen to life. God will bless their life. And here's the deal. None of us, at least as far as I know, we don't have any four-star generals in here and we don't have any presidents in here, do we? President of the United States in here? No. So none of you have to worry about that big theory about how does this work for war. Because none of you are thinking about that right now. We get distracted with the big ideas instead of applying it to our neighbor next door, right? So that enemy in the office or that person down the road. That's what Jesus is calling us to. To love others around us. And so we strive for perfection. We get rid of those condemning thoughts and attitudes that say, well, I'm just a sinner. It's no big deal. But through Christ, you're a child of God. Through Christ, you've been perfected. So why don't we get caught up with the fact that in the eyes of God, we are loved, we are valuable, we are forgiven, and he has called us to follow after him. Let's not listen to those condemning thoughts that always want to beat us up. Let's tell the story that we're children of God, that we're a part of what he's doing in this world, that we're loved and we're secured by him, that we're saints. Like, tell yourself that story, because that's the story the gospel tells you. So that you can then live with confidence and security, knowing that, listen, I'm a Jesus follower, this is how he's asked me to live, and I believe and I trust him enough that my be me doing this, his grace is going to come through. His works are going to come through. 
his blessing and he's going to start activating and whatever that looks like, he's going to show up in the middle of this thing I don't understand, but, but me, by me being faithful, I believe he's going to show up. I believe he's going to start working. And that's when we start living by his power rather than our own. And here's the deal, we're almost done. We don't have to wonder, wonder what this is going to look like. We go into this attitude and this mindset expecting to be insulted, expecting to be taken advantage of, to look weak, knowing we're giving up our rights for the gospel, knowing that through that, Jesus can change lives, knowing that policies can change, all sorts of people's hearts can be changed, goodness of God will be brought into dark situations. We know this because this was grace applied to Jesus's life. What he came and did changed the world literally. So we go into this knowing it's not going to be fair, it's not going to be easy, but we do it anyways so the gospel shines through. So people get to know him, so they can find Jesus, they can come on board to follow him. This is grace applied. It's great to experience grace. It's very difficult to give it to others. But that's the calling because of what he's done for us. And if you're here and you haven't received God's grace, if um, salvation and becoming a Jesus follower, if you don't know what that is or you've never heard of that, um, having a relationship with him, it comes by simply accepting his gift of salvation, accepting what he's done for you on the cross. And if you haven't done that, we'd love to talk with you after the service about that more. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you just thinking about grace just thinking about your love. While we were broken sinners, you died for us. You gave up so we could live. Father, we are so thankful for that. Help us live into that grace. Help us extend that grace to other people. Help us live this out in our everyday life because, Lord, it's not going to be easy, but we know through your power, through your Spirit, we can do it. Not for us to get the glory, but for you, Father. So people will be glorified by our good works, by our good deeds. They will know there's something different about us, and we can tell them that difference is Jesus. We love you, and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.